Welcome to People of Process. Design is everywhere. So when I travel, I like to observe how various businesses market and brand themselves. And the focus of this movie was inspired by a restaurant I saw in Boston. Now, as you can see, it looks like a very colorful owner and entrepreneur who seems to be doing just fine promoting his business, but who also has a somewhat fragmented brand identity, to say the least. I mean, if you, if you look at these images, which are different locations of this business, you can see it has one signage in one location using one completely different typeface than what's on another one. And then does it really have a logo? You have this, which is like a server platter with a lobster on it. And then you have an image of his car with a lobster on it. And that's derived from the fact he, he actually has a vehicle where he had this. By the way, this is brilliant marketing, uh, doing the, the genius level marketing, what I'd say. Uh, and I think this is awesome. This is part of the brand identity. Uh, but I believe it got so much attention that he kind of decided to use it as a logo of sorts, and it's not that great. So you can see, I, I think the main reason a lot of these these things happen where it's the signage on the side of the building or the signage on the sign itself, or in this location, it's a circular motif. I think most of that happens because these people aren't working with uh, brand I identity designers or a design firm who knows how to pull all these things together and keep it cohesive. Um, this owner probably open up a new location, goes to a sign shop. The sign shop sells them on a circular motif. He says, great. And they just throw something together. That's usually how these things happen. Uh, they're not kind of overseen by a brand manager per se, or a marketing director who understands branding. Um, so you tend to get this. So this is where my inspiration came from. And it's what's going to be the focus of this movie. Now, this is best shown than explained. So let's dive into it. and You'll see what I'm going to do here. Now, a lot of you have been responding uh, with questions on the YouTube channel. And some of you keep asking about the drawing process. And uh, could I show more about that? Well, unfortunately, I really don't have an ideal setup for doing live action video, which means physical video of capturing me drawing. Um, so that tends to be why I kind of handle it as embedded images in my movie as shown here. But I do want to talk about uh, the the drawing process and the tools I use for drawing. So the brand I use is called Tombow and the specific uh, type of pencil, their line of pencils that is, uh, one of them is called mono line pencils. I like to use 2B. Um, you, they have different, uh, different um, not settings, but uh, different hardness in terms of the, the graphite within each pencil, but I prefer 2B. Um, it's soft enough, but not too soft. And then the specific uh, eraser they have to go with their pencils called Mono. And I like that because I like white erasers because it doesn't rub off pigment when I'm, I'm drawing. And I like to do physical drawing. Now, if you do all your drawing on an iPad, then you don't have to worry about any of this, obviously. So, uh, but these are the, the pencils I get. I usually buy them off of Amazon now, uh, which they're pretty inexpensive, but I buy them a box at a time. And one eraser like this might last me about six months and then I'll replace it with another one. So these are the tools I use. And at, at some point, hopefully, um, I'll be able to capture the live drawing process. Um, I did buy a gimbal. So um, hopefully I'll be able to do that maybe with a, uh, the next generation of iPhone that I get. So let's keep moving forward here. Our theme is a lobster based off of the reference. And so I always try to find good reference. It's going to kind of give me all the insight I need to know what makes a lobster a lobster. What are the characteristics of a lobster? Well, obviously, two big lobster claws is the big one. Um, the, the remaining legs, in this case, he has eight legs. You want to make sure to get that count right. 
And if you look at his tail, because lobster tail is basically a dish in almost every high-end restaurant, and it has characteristics to it in terms of its shape and and the way it's formatted. So you have these rounded edges here in each segment represented by these lines and then down in the bottom in the tail. Uh, this is made up of seven different uh, pieces of, of shell here and you can see how that's um, kind of arranged. So it's all about looking at the realistic and kind of deducing down into simple shape and simple form and that's what I do with drawing. And all I did here is I simplified it into a line type drawing and specifically a beefy line. Um, I wanted this really thick. And as I'm paying attention to those characteristics, like in his tail, I want to handle the shapes kind of like this. Now, this is an imperfect drawing. It doesn't need to be perfect. I can build precisely uh, with geometric shapes in Illustrator. And uh, specifically for this style, we're going to be working in strokes only. And so this is going to be a very simple way uh, to build and approach a motif like this. But it's all about looking at the complexity of real life and simplifying it down into a deduced format, an iconic format, if you will, uh, that's going to work great. And I think these are going to work just fine as shown here and we don't even need to draw it in any more uh, precise way in order to build so let's keep moving forward this is our rough sketch here i dropped a guide because we're only going to build half of it and then reflect it to the other side so when it comes to building a design like this i don't want to try to build that thickness into it that's easy enough to get with a stroke i just want to focus on building the strokes themselves. So that's what I'm going to do here. And all we have here is two point strokes. So if we go to the stroke panel here, you can see we're working in two points. We're going to stick with that. I'm going to go to the pin tool. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to just build the additional leg here. So we're, we want to go ahead and put this leg in here. And I'm trying to keep these gaps in between these legs the exact same. So that's how I'll space it like this. This curve, we could do that by just simply drawing a line like this and then switching to the anchor point tool and bending it. If you wanted to do it that way, you could. Um, I tend to use a plugin by Astute Graphics. It's called Subscribe, and the specific tool is Arch by Points tool. And I use it because I can just figure out where I want to start, click, go to where I want the path to in, in this case, right down, probably right about there. And then I can just bring it up here like that and I get a curve exactly the way I want. So you don't have to monkey around with the Bezier curve or uh, anything like that with handles. Um, it just makes the process go uh, a lot faster. And you can see the other elements as we have here in the head, I created this side. So this would be one example where I go ahead and clone the shape, Command-C, Command-F. I use F3, that's my keyboard shortcut, and you can watch a video on that. Then I go to the Reflection tool and reflect it to the other side. We don't need this straight line, so we'll get rid of that last anchor. And I'm just going to drag select these anchors at the tip and Command-J to join those. That kind of welds paths together, Command-J. So just remember that it's something you'll end up using quite a bit. Now, once I have these elements built, I'll just select all these elements on the left, including the tail elements down here and this one, and I'll clone these, Command-C, Command-F. I have applied to the F3 key, so I just hit F3. It clones all of those. I find a central anchor point using the Reflect tool, and I reflect them over. Then down here, these two need to be fused together. So I'll direct select both anchors and command J to weld those paths together as well. Now, obviously, I don't want these lines to be this thin. My drawing reflects about how beefy it is. Right now, these are two-point strokes. So if I select everything, and keep, keep in mind that all of these we're going to build using strokes, the only exception are the beady little eyes of the of the lobster. Those are just uh, filled circular shapes. So 
those we're not going to do this to, but we'll select everything minus the BDIs. And on these, we want to beef these lines up. So let's go to strokes and we're going to go from two. We're going to go all the way to 20 here. And this is going to beef that up to kind of match um, our underlying drawing. Now, one thing I want to show you before I keep moving forward is that in the tail area, I have these segments like this, but I don't want the caps or the end of these paths uh, to be squared off. And that's what this is. This is a flat cap. We want to turn these into a round cap because it will give us that look and feel we want. Now, one thing I should point out, let's go back to layers. I'm going to turn this on is this is the original shape, original path I had for this segment in the tail. Then we beefed it up to 20. Well, I did all of them originally when I first did it, but then let's go ahead and zoom in. You can see I figured out it needed a gap in here. So I had to adjust them in order to get that gap to be the same on all of them. And that's what this shape over here represents it represents that negative space in between these elements because we're not going to keep these as strokes. We're going to expand all of this and this will be the gap tolerance we're going to use uh, to create everything. So what we need to do first though is on the head, you see how it's fusing together? It'll fuse together if um, we expand it like this. So I'm going to pull this over about that far. That should be good enough. And now all we're going to do is we're going to expand all of our um, all of our beefy strokes here. So let's go ahead and select everything minus the gap and minus the BDIs like this. And we'll go to object. We'll go to path. We'll go to um, outline stroke. It's going to turn everything into fills, no strokes. Then what I'm going to do is just turn it all to outline so I can see my sketch behind it. And so now you can see we have all these shapes, no fill, just strokes. But we want to edit some of this because that gap we have in the tail section here between these elements, we want to carry through elsewhere. And so that's what we need to address now. So what we're going to do is on the pincher at the top here, we're going to select all those, select all these legs and all these things. We'll go ahead and unite together with Pathfinder. And I always click on appearance because it'll turn it to a group. We're going to change that to a compound. And I have F7 set up as a keyboard shortcut. If you don't, just go to object, go to compound, go to make. Notice I have F7 because I never have to go to the menu. So that'll be ready for when we edit those. Let's go down here to the bottom. We're going to select this bottom shape. This shape right here, you can see, is seven points tall. Now, I always work in whole numbers. I always work in points because it makes it go faster. So knowing that the gap is seven, we're going to select this shape, and we're going to go to Object Path, Offset Path, and we're going to punch in not 10, but 7 to match it. You can preview it to make sure it's right. It is. And then just so we can see what we're doing, let's go ahead and color this yellow. So we have this shape. We want this to be on top of all the other shapes like that. Now all we have to do is we're going to go ahead and select these shapes, the circular shape, these two donuts and these two curves like that. And we'll go ahead and unite all of those check appearance, turn that into a compound path. And with the shape that we made on top, we'll select the shapes we reunite, united and we're going to go minus front. Oops. Let's do that again. Oh, I forgot to do an offset here. Let's offset this one. Normally when I'm, by the way, when I'm working like this, I'm not sitting here with a running commentary. So, uh, so forgive me for that. So let's go ahead and offset that exact same principle as we did on this bottom shape of the tail. Make sure this is on top. 
Now, once we've edited, we already added this gap in here on the left and right, but notice uh, we didn't do anything to the donuts because I forgot to make uh, this shape. Now, it's good to point this out because if I go to appearance, after we made that gap edit with the minus front, it reverts back to a group. And you, you always want to turn it back into a compound because if I decide to take this and making sure this is on top, select these donut shapes now, and I go, well, let's go ahead and minus front, you're going to run into that. And this is really annoying because Adobe considers this normal behavior. It really shouldn't be. Um, it shouldn't just disappear. Why would that be normal? It, it's, it's stupid. Um, it, it should always retain the compound nature until you tell it not to. Uh, that's how it was in freehand that I used for 15 years. But in Adobe Illustrator, it's not. So before you make any additional edits, make sure to check appearance. And if it says group, just make sure it's a compound. That way you can take a shape like the one we offset here, go to Pathfinder and make another edit minus front, and it's going to work the way it should. Now it's going to still revert back, in which case I still go back and I make it a compound. Now we're going to take this shape because I did forget to do another, um, another edit with the offset. So we'll go back to seven. I'm not going to bother to color it since you know what I'm doing now. And we're just going to edit this bottom uh, part of the tail by minus front. So that way we have all these nice gaps in between everything. Now, some of the detailing we're going to do on this, uh, we want those gaps and some of it we don't want. So the antenna, for example, we don't want those gaps. We want it to fuse right into the base of the body. But notice I didn't pay attention. And so it's not quite cutting into the body here. So how would you do that without using Command-Z? Well, I'm going to show you a really cool plugin. It's part of VectorScribe by Astute Graphics. Is I'm going to go to the scissor tool. And I'm just going to cut these right there and there. Isolate this path and get rid of it. So I want to extend this path. And wouldn't it be cool if you could just click and pull and it would continue the geometry into this area? Well, that's what this tool does. It's called Extend Path Tool. We just click on it, pull it, and it extends the geometry. Done. I can go back and I can close this shape again with the pin tool. Now we have everything we need. Since the one on the right isn't correct, we'll just take this, we'll clone it, Command C, Command F, find a central anchor point and reflect that over. Um, all of these don't matter because we're going to add a gap in between uh, the elements on the left, which make up uh, the claw and all the legs down below. We already have that if you look at the appearance panel as a compound path. So we can actually get rid of the ones on the right because we'll just reflect these over again. Uh, but notice again, that same problem we ran into with the antenna. I don't even know if that's what it's called, antenna. Um, I want this, as you can see in my drawing, this curve down kind of comes to the base where the base of the other one is. So we're going to use this functionality uh, to get what we need here, like that. We're going to go ahead and move this over a little bit, and then I'll go to the Extend tool, and I'm going to extend this further down. And you can see how it just continues the geometry established in the path, and it just allows you to continue it. So this is great. I use this functionality all the time whenever I run into this, because otherwise you'd have to just rebuild it. And or command Z back to a point where you could fix it before you uh, committed to it. So I'm just going to create this now by trimming off the bottom so it matches the right side here by minus front, like that. Now I'm going to take a throwaway shape like this, and we're going to take the shape that we have of the body. I'm going to clone it, command Z, command F, select the throwaway shape, intersect. I'm just creating a shape to edit this part now. And all I'm doing is I'm going to bring this over right about there. We're going to select this shape. We're going to go to object. We're going to go path. We're going to go to offset path. Seven is the tolerance. No longer need the original one. And now I can go ahead. We can just take this, clone it, 
I'm going to just make it a little bigger, drag it over, because I don't want it to eat into this shape. So just like that, then I can select this shape, then I'll trim that edge, and now we have that consistent gap going from here into that area. And uh, that extend tool just is a lifesaver at times to do this kind of work. Uh, now we're going to uh, we're going to take this and we're going to offset this now that it's corrected. Same tolerance. We'll go ahead and color it yellow sitting on top of all these shapes. And we'll minus front to add that. Oh, I just noticed um, it's the, the extend path down here. Let's fix that. So again, we're going to go ahead and cut this and cut this, get rid of this path like that. And we'll use the extend path to go beyond that like this. And we'll close it. Now we'll select these and we'll minus front. That adds all the gaps. Now when we make that edit, it's going to go back to a group. So I'm going to change it to compound. I'm going to go ahead and make a copy so I can reflect it to the right. Now we have everything needed over there. Now one thing, when you beef up a stroke and then you outline it so it becomes just a shape that you can fill, It'll do this on certain mitering corners where this curve technically should curve and come out right about here, not here. But for some reason, Illustrator makes it do this where it goes straight. And I didn't like that. So this is another reason why I love having plugins is I can go ahead. Actually, let's do this first. Let's go ahead and color this one yellow. And then we're going to make a copy of it, clone it. And we'll turn this one back into magenta. That way you can see what I'm correcting here. And I'm just going to cut these with this scissor tool, get rid of that. And now we're going to go back to the extend path tool. I'm going to extend this out here and watch this one. See how it should curve if it followed the math? If Well, I should put if Illustrator's algorithms followed the math, it would have ended like this, not like the yellow one shows. And it looks better this way too, so that's why I'm fixing it. So I'll close the path. Once I have it closed, I'll just go to Unite, and that will allow me to select this and just get rid of it. Then I can select the problematic one, which was yellow, get rid of that. Delete the one on the right, because now the one on the left is the way we want. And... I can go ahead and clone it, and let's go ahead and re-reflect it to the right. So these are the kind of details I pay attention to when I'm building like this. But uh, let's jump a little further. Let's go to the base black and white here, uh, the exact same artwork. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to round it because... Um, everything I don't want to come to a distinct straight edge. Some of these I want rounded. I wanted rounding in the tail because it kind of reflects the attributes you see in a lobster tail. But on the, the, the legs themselves, their legs kind of come to a point. And so I want to kind of imply that without making it, you know, really uh, pointy. I don't even know if that's a word. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, the rounding tool uh, by Astute Graphics. Now, I should point out, you can use the rounding uh, corner fillet tool in Illustrator. You can select a point like this and round it. That's fine. So everything I'm showing you, you could do natively. It's just going to take you longer uh, because of the way they integrated the rounding feature in Illustrator. That's why I only use it for certain things. I prefer dynamic corners by Astute Graphics because I can just click on any corner. I don't have to highlight an anchor. I just go to any corner and I say round it. Once I've done it once, I can just click and apply it to whatever ones I want. Now these, I think I want these to go in the opposite direction. Yeah, that looks better like this. And then I can apply it to the other corners as well. So I'll do that on these legs over here like that and we'll do it there 
Now, once I have these like this, I tend to unite and then I'll go back in and I'll even do some subtle rounds, uh, another rounding attempt on this where I'll go back in and I'll just add subtle rounds kind of like that just so it doesn't come to a distinct point. I just think that looks uh, more button, more custom. And it's funny because uh, yesterday I met with a client. I am branding a, a library and he pulls out. Now, librarians are notorious for uh, saving everything. And, and this was a, a glorious example. He pulled out their branding from 1973 and all the comps were on uh, paste up board and their marker drawings. And I mean, it just brought back a lot of memories because I learned all that traditionally when I went to art school. And it was funny because all the inking that they did on logos back then, they would ink it out really big. And then because it was shot on an optical camera to get various sizes for what were called slick sheets, um, it would round off the corners. So what designers do today, like I'm doing on purpose, is because we like that aesthetic, but it wasn't the case when graphics were done in the 70s. You wanted it sharp and clean, and it was only because of bad uh, reproduction methods that that rounding came into play. But it's funny how that uh, became an aesthetic that works really well, and, and I'm guilty of it too. So that's the kind of rounding I'll do on these. So when it gets up here, I would round it. So let's go ahead and focus on um, this claw. And I'm going to turn on this layer and just pay attention to uh, the corners here where everything comes to a point. And this will just show you the subtle rounds I put at the end there. And I think that just really helps. And if you look on the interior, uh, the interior shapes here, once again, here's without a round, with round, on those as well. So I think it, re it really does help. It really does make something uh, look a, a lot better when it's all said and done, more buttoned up, more custom. Now, when I get to this point, I want to reinforce something that's really important because it's the one error I see made most when people are working on graphics and design like this, is that you want all your negative space uh, to have continuity. So all the gaps in this design have the same weight. And that's important because if you don't have that, you add um, what I call visual tension. And the more elements of visual tension that are inconsistent uh, is what makes a design go from good to bad. So you want to pay attention to your negative continuity, but also your positive continuity. Now, there's always exceptions to any kind of rules like this. So uh, what would the exception be here? Well, the exception would be the beady little eyes of this lobster. Um, it's neither the size of the gap nor the size of the thickness, and that's okay because it adds character and it goes well with the design, and it would kind of look a little cold without that kind of personality. So uh, lobsters aren't black, though, unless they die and you don't want to eat seafood that's black. <laughs> uh, it's a nice lobster color. So this would be the brand color I'm working with here. And I took this guy and locked it up with some type and came up with this. I thought this came out really cool. I love it. I love a T-shirt of this, by the way. And it also, this type of style works really great if you're, you're needing to put it on a dark colored background or a photographic colored background uh, because you can simply uh, reverse it and knock it out of that background as well. So it works great in that context. Now, the whole lobster culture on the East Coast is, is pretty impressive. I, actually, I like crab better than lobster, but this is a good restaurant. And uh, that whole area on the East Coast, lobster is everywhere. And I just think this fits right in uh, with that culture. And I even pitched this guy on it, but I never heard anything in reply. I didn't really expect to. Uh, I've only had maybe two times that's ever worked pitching somebody cold like that. And besides, he's successful Technically, much like Google for years had a really bad logo, 
but did it in fact uh, affect their business and their success? Not really. So uh, no surprise he didn't go for it. By the way, if you like this typography, um, check out Mark uh, Canesso. Uh, his website is pstypelab.com. Also, the font I use for this design is called Quadro Black. Arguably my favorite sans font. Um, probably use it way too much, all the different members of the family. <laughs> way too much, actually. If you scrutinize some of my design, you'll see this show up over and over again. But it's also available on Adobe Fonts, so you can check out uh, all the fonts he has available uh, through Adobe Fonts as well. So um, anyway, the beauty of this style is that it is one that anyone should be able to pull off. And remember, even though I went beefy with my stroke, uh, stroke weight, the style could be done in a lighter weight stroke as well. So the style is flexible in that respect. Uh, thank you for all the comments on YouTube. There have been some really good questions and they have led to me creating content addressing them. Uh, so keep them coming. If you like this channel, please share a link to it via social media. That'll help me grow it so I can develop even more content and hopefully at some point work in uh, live video as well. And make sure to subscribe and you'll be notified of the most recent content when posted. Thank you for watching People of Process. I hope this content helps you improve your own creative process.